with ExecuNet. I'm speaking today with Peter Bregman. Hey, Peter. And Peter, of course, is a CEO advisor, leadership consultant, and author of the book 18 Minutes. And what have I left out, Peter? Uh, the subtitle, Find Your Focus, Master Distraction, and Get the Right Things Done. I couldn't possibly remember all that. <laughs> I got the 18 minutes part right. So today we're talking about leadership development, emotional courage, and some related themes. So to kick things off, Peter, let's talk about leadership development. In fact, um, let's talk about a challenge that lots of leaders are facing. Namely, they, they want to develop, certainly. They go to all these training programs. We're all vaguely familiar with them at, at, at best or at worst. And where else can they honestly learn about how to be better leaders from their peers, from the directs? What's the answer? You know, it's an, it's an interesting question. And when you talk about CEO development, right, you're, you're raising the level of the conversation because where do CEOs go to get developed, right? They're not really going through the leadership development programs in their organizations. That's a whole other topic, which we'll probably talk about a little bit today, which is the challenge of the leadership development programs that most organizations have. But it's hard for them to confide, in some cases, in their colleagues. They don't really have colleagues. They have direct reports. And they have other C-level colleagues, but those are direct reports. And, and then they have their board, who they report to. So it's an unusual situation for them to be in. And, uh, and, and that's true also for the senior leaders in organizations. I mean, I've worked with a lot of organizations where they've developed leadership development programs but then they don't participate in them because they don't really want to be in the same classes. and So maybe they'll get some coaching on the side, which is really useful. But the challenge of continuing to develop senior leaders in the organization is a really fundamental challenge in organizations. That, that when it's not done properly, limits the growth of the organization. And how does it affect the leader personally when they're sort of starved for the right type of leadership development training, if you will? You know, most leaders who have grown up in an organization or moved from one organization to another, but who have finally gotten to this level of senior leadership in an organization, they are highly achievement oriented, they're driven, they want to keep growing, they want to keep growing their organizations. Right? If they're good and they're running a billion dollar company, they're thinking about how to get to a two billion dollar company. Or if they're running a five million dollar company, they're looking at how to get to a ten or twenty million dollar company. And so these people need to grow themselves as they grow their companies. The, the, the uh, problem with not developing their own skills is that they then can't grow the company beyond themselves. Right. And it's a problem that I see in a lot of organizations. And I see a lot of people who are great at bringing the company to a certain point and then can't, whether it's the CEO or the leadership team, can't get the organization to the next level, to the next point, because they themselves don't have the skills or haven't grown. And that's really frustrating to them in many ways, but they also don't necessarily know where to go that's comfortable to them to actually begin to learn and develop their skills. Now, right. now leadership is always hard, no matter what conditions you're driving in. It's not an easy thing to do. Would you say we're experiencing a, a crisis in leadership in, in this day and age? You know, a, a crisis is a strong word, um, so I don't know that I would say crisis. But I would say that, yes, there's, there's you know, I think, I think leaders are constantly growing. They're constantly developing themselves. They're, they're, they're you know, constantly trying to become better at what they do. But there is a, um, there is sort of a, I would almost call it a crisis in terms of how we develop leaders. Meaning I think we um, haven't really changed how we develop leaders over the last 30 or 40 years. You know, we, we grab a bunch of books and we get methodology out of it and we teach them the methodology and we pass knowledge from one place to another and we expect them to implement that knowledge. Um, coaching is a little bit new and that's really helpful on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, you can't do that for all of the leadership in an entire organization that's big. It tends to be kind of expensive to do in an organization, although I do a lot of coaching and, and I think that's an effective way of more personalized help to senior leaders. But I think there's a challenge to say, how do we actually get to the next level? And I see a lot of organizations growing to a certain level and then literally having to let go of, to fire, the people who are really successful at bringing them to that level because those aren't the people that can bring them to the next level. Now in some ways, that's a crisis of leadership, right? It's a crisis of leadership that um, I could be really helpful to an organization in helping them to grow to 100 million, 
but I'm not the guy who can get it to 200 million. And the truth is, if I am not that guy, and I can't develop my skills, the CEO is right to fire me, right? I mean, I don't belong in that organization, even if I've been great at bringing it to 100, if I've been loyal and supportive, great at bringing it up to 100 million. If I can't develop my skills to bring it to that next level, I don't belong there, right? right? And so that's sort of a crisis, it's a, it's a, it's a shame, right? I mean, you're, the, the CEO is doing the right thing, but it's a shame because you really want, and it's painful. Right. It's painful for CEOs that I know that look at people who have been incredibly loyal to them, incredibly helpful, and yet can't make it to the next level. Then the truth is they have to either put them in a job where they don't do harm, or they have to let them go and bring in people who can bring them to the next level. Wouldn't it be great if, there were, if we were more skilled at a process that takes these people who are really, really great at doing a great job for us and help them get over their hump so that they can continue to grow with the company? Sure. And it's a challenge that affects so many companies and by extension so many people. So many lives are changed uh, poorly for, for this reason. Can we distill from what we've talked about so far what why we really are terrible at developing these leaders? What's what's really in the way? I think you you've touched on this, but let's kind of yeah yeah. I think um, I think it, it has to do you know if you really want to paint a big picture, it has to do with the way we view education. Mm -hmm. But the idea that if I want to train, if I want to develop your leadership, what I got what I have to do is I have to share a bunch of ideas with you that make sense and that are smart and that will help you lead, and you're going to absorb those ideas and then change your behavior. And there was this great uh, uh, Far Side cartoon that I saw once, which had a scientist and with all, who, was, who was writing uh, equations all over uh, you know, a wall. And there were a group of other scientists who were watching him. And he had a whole bunch of, of equations on one side. And then he had an arrow to a whole bunch of other equations on this side. And over the, over the arrow, he had written the words, then a miracle occurs. <laughs> right? And, and the scientist, you know, the, the, the text of the cartoon was, you know, um, and it was sort of step one, and then step two, then a miracle occurs, and then step three, all the other equations. Yeah. And the scientist was raising that saying, I have a question about step two. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think that's a little bit how we think about development, right? Which is that we, you know, we give all of this information, and then kind of a miracle occurs, and then you're able to do all that stuff perfectly. And it's that transition between, I know what to do, and I'm actually doing it, there's a massive gap, right? It's a massive gap in organizations. And leadership development, for the most part, does a great job at teaching us what it is that we should do, and a terrible job at helping us to transition that into day-to-day -day behavior. So you have a tremendous number of leaders, of people who are really smart, who really have a sense of what it is that needs to happen, and who aren't particularly good at making that happen in their organization. So it's not a crisis of knowledge. It's a crisis of, uh, of, of ability, capability, of implementation, of execution. Right. And that's not something you get from sitting in a classroom taking notes from what someone's telling you. Sure. And it, it sounds like a familiar classic problem of uh, business development or growth where best laid plans, you can't really execute. Right. It's like, no, it didn't really happen. Right. 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 Okay. So um, let's let's pick up from there, Peter. So, um, what does in fact work work with CEOs and their teams Leadership. developing? Yeah. So the the thing that works is when you teach them the I don't even know that I want to call it a skill, but it kind of is a skill um, to translate that information. Right. I, I go in to training leaders with the assumption. For the most part, they know what they need to know. Sometimes there's different things that they need to know. Sometimes they need to learn some new things. But it's very rare that I've seen a leader on any level of organization fail for lack of knowledge. Right? But it's about doing those things, which is what I talked about. And, and the key skill, if you want to call it a skill, that's needed to translate knowledge into action is what I call emotional courage. So the reason we don't do things, honestly, is that we're afraid. And nobody wants to say that they're afraid. But why do I not have a difficult conversation? Why do I not bring up something that's an undiscussable that people aren't talking about? Why don't I, why aren't I the person who brings it up? Why don't I respond to someone's anger at me in a really productive way? Why do I get triggered by their anger? 
Right? Why do I get caught up in that? Why do I respond to someone's politics with more politics? Why don't I just call it like it is and on the table and say, let's have a conversation? Why don't I get over my own anger? You know, in, in why don't I feel it fully but get over it enough to have a productive conversation? Why don't I do those things? And it has to do with courage. It has to do with, um, are we able to master the feelings that we have, the emotions that we have? Now, I'm not talking about emotional intelligence. Frankly, I'm not crazy about emotional intelligence, right? At the way we've used it, the way we've talked about it. And it's because emotional intelligence, for the most part, is an intellectual construct. Right. You know, the way we talk about emotion in the world of emotional intelligence is about as unemotional as you could possibly get. Right? We break it into categories, we label it, we talk about it, we analyze it, we script out the behaviors. Right. And that's the way the mind addresses emotions. Mm -hmm. But I actually think that's not a particularly good way of actually learning to master your emotions in these kinds of situations. And I think the emotion that we feel when we are um, when, when we're called to show courage is very very challenging, mm -hmm. and and it nobody really wants to uh, think of themselves as fearful or uncourageous, right? Uh, on the other hand, there's a lot of things we actually don't do for lack of courage, right. and so I think to teach this idea of emotional courage becomes really really important, and that to me is the key. Um, uh, the key missing link between what I know how to do and what I actually do. And, and in a sense, it's, a, um, it's, 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 it's the driver to how we take risk. So if, if the thing that makes us most successful as a leader is our willingness and ability to take risk, then emotional courage is the catalyst that allows us to take risks. It opens the door that allows us to step in and take risks. And when you're able, to, when you have the emotional courage to take the right kinds of risks, that's what doubles the stock price or triples the stock price. That's what brings revenue from 100 million to 200 million or a billion to 2 billion. Let's round out that definition of emotional courage. I understand it's about taking risk. What else is really um, its fundamental property throughout? You know, emotional courage is feeling certain feelings strongly, mm -hmm. but not letting them not letting those feelings, not letting the way you feel in those feelings control your actions. Mm -hmm. So I might feel anger, but it takes a lot of courage to feel anger and not get angry. It's okay to feel those things. It's okay to feel those things. You have to feel those right. things. If you don't, you repress them and they leak out in insidious, dangerous ways. Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel fear, right? If I pretend I don't feel fear, I'm going to do stupid stuff, right. right, to pretend that I don't feel fear that's going to come out in an awkward, inauthentic, damaging way. But if I can allow myself to really feel afraid, and in the context of that feeling, still move forward with the actions I think are necessary to take, that's emotional courage. Right. And that's the thing that makes the difference for leaders. The leaders with emotional courage make things happen. The leaders who don't have emotional courage get in their own and other people's way. How many leaders and I know it's, it's a hard number to, to pin down, but is it a, a, a characteristic, a quality that you find in most leaders? Are they emotionally courageous?